please open your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter number 37, where we will pick up in verse 11 in just one moment. When I was closing our session yesterday, I told you that this information from the inspired Word of God disproves a legend that has been prominently believed in Jewish circles, and now I'm seeing it believed in Christian circles. Uh, what I'm referring to is 2 Maccabees chapter 2, which this book was written uh, shortly after the events of the great Maccabean heroic efforts uh, of that 2nd century BC. But in this, in this legendary material, it says that Jeremiah the prophet took the Ark of the Covenant and uh, apparently the old tabernacle of Moses, along with other things, and hid them for later use on a mountain. And so there's a lot of people that believe that the Ark of the Covenant is where Jeremiah hid them under this mountain. Well, it's not possible, because he never had that opportunity. Because as we will revisit momentarily... Uh, Jeremiah was already on the outs with the leadership of Jerusalem uh, whenever the Babylonians arrived to begin their final siege. And so he never was granted any access toward the holy items in the temple. And then he ends up arrested by the Jewish authorities in our story today and is not released from that custody until the Babylonians have completely taken the city and are in the process of dismantling it. So he never got anywhere near the Ark of the Covenant in order to secret away. So any of you that have uh, heard the uh, legend of Jeremiah and the Ark of the Covenant, you can discount it as completely untrue because we have the truth of the Word of God that says otherwise. I think if you'd like to know what really happened to the Ark of the Covenant, you just go to the book of Revelation. Because the next time in Scripture, after the time of the Ark of the Covenant in the time of Jeremiah, that we hear of the Ark, it's in heaven. So I am of the very strongly held opinion that God confiscated the Ark of the Covenant miraculously Uh, during the time of Jeremiah, and uh, kept it on on hold to be used by his son as his millennial throne. Uh, That's my uh, opinion, and I'm sticking to it. But let's look at the text and see what it actually tells us happened in the spring of 589 BC, whenever the new pharaoh comes out against the Babylonians to kind of chase them away from his region. And he's going to fail doing that. Jeremiah 37, 11. Now, when the Chaldean army had withdrawn from Jerusalem at the approach of Pharaoh's army, so they're out chasing the uh, Egyptians back to Egypt, uh, they withdraw from their active siege of Jerusalem. And so Jeremiah takes advantage of this lull of military activity to take uh, care of some family business. He needs to see uh, to the administration of some of his homeland at Anatoth, which is immediately north of Jerusalem. Uh, Jeremiah set out from Jerusalem to go to the land of Benjamin. Uh, Benjamin is actually uh, just immediately north of the Temple Mount. In fact, part of the Mount of Olives appears to be Benjamite territory. Uh, So he went there to receive his portion there among the people. When he was at the Benjamin Gate, so named because it dumps into the Benjamin territory out of Jerusalem, a sentry there named Iriah, the son of Shalemiah, son of Hananiah, seized Jeremiah the prophet saying, you're deserting to the Chaldeans. Jeremiah said, it's a lie. I'm not deserting to the Chaldeans. But Iriah would not listen to him and seized Jeremiah and brought him to the officials. 
So all Jeremiah is trying to do is take care of family things. It should have been a quick part of a day trip out and back again. But instead, this sentry accuses him of being a deserter, a traitor. And he arrests him and hands him over to the officials who are already angry with him for preaching about how the Babylonians are the hand of God. The Babylonians need to be surrendered to because they are God's uh, tool in all of this. So these officials were enraged at Jeremiah. They beat him, and then they imprisoned him in the house of Jonathan the secretary, for it had been made a prison. So now he is confined in a makeshift prison. Now, when Jeremiah had come to the dungeon cells and remained there many days, King Zedekiah sent for him and received him. Uh, So after he's cooled his heels there for a while, King Zedekiah brings him for a little private conference with him. He wants to talk to him about stuff. The king questioned him secretly in his house and said, Is there any word from he who is? Now, Zedekiah keeps hoping that there will be miraculous salvation, that God will protect Jerusalem. But it's never been the case. God has always responded with no judgments coming, and it's going to include judgment on you, King Zedekiah. So he asks once again, do you have, you know, word from he who is? Maybe some different different information? And Jeremiah said, there is. He said, you shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon. Now, that's not new news. That's old news. That's what Zedekiah has been told repeatedly. Jeremiah also said to King Zedekiah, What wrong have I done to you or your servants or this people that you put me in prison? So he wants to know why. Why am I being confined right now? Now, we speculate that Jeremiah was probably about 20 whenever he began his ministry. And so he's been at this for almost 40 years. So he's somewhere in the neighborhood of 60. He's about my age. And I'm telling you, I would not like to be confined in a nasty jail cell, especially a makeshift one, uh, and not being treated well by the guards. It would not be helpful to my health. And so that's his response is, why? Why are you doing this to me? Verse 19, where are your prophets who prophesied to you saying, the king of Babylon will not come against you and against this land? Now that's, that's a dig at the fact that Jeremiah has told them for four decades this was coming. Other prophets, some who actually smacked him, beat on him, have been saying, no, God's going God's to protect. The Babylonians will never get near here. The Babylonians will run away. The Babylonians are going to uh, be defeated, and then all of those that they've already taken away, they'll return, and we'll get all the things back from the temple. And those guys were all plainly wrong. They've been proved wrong repeatedly. And so Jeremiah is insinuating, why am I in jail for telling things that are clearly true while the guys that said things that are clearly false aren't being put in jail? Verse 20, now hear please, O my Lord the King, let my humble plea come before you. Don't send me back to the house of Jonathan the secretary lest I die there. So he's serious. He does not want to go back to that makeshift prison. Apparently, it was really nasty and not comfortable. So Zedekiah gave orders, and they committed Jeremiah to the court of the guard. Uh, The court of the guard is probably the security office for the Temple Mount and for uh, maybe even uh, a combination of of the temple complex and the royal complex. And so it is an official security zone. And so it probably had a little bit uh, better accommodations for those that are being held for, uh, for trial. 
And a loaf of bread was given him daily from the baker's street until all the bread of the city was gone. And so Jeremiah remained in the court of the guard. So this is where he will spend the rest of the siege. And so, like I said, we're in the spring of 589. The city will fall in the summer of 587. So he's going to be here for the next two years. He'll have a daily ration of bread, enough to, you know, stay alive, uh, very much in alignment with uh, Ezekiel's prophetic uh, demonstration. And he'll have water in order to stay hydrated during all this time. But he's never going to be released until the Babylonians release him. So again, no chance could he have ever taken the Ark of the Covenant away and secreted it on a hill. Uh, Chapter number 38. Now, Shaphatiah, the son of Matan, Gedaliah, the son of Pashur, and Jeremiah and Pashur have already been having a lot of backs and forths that were not pleasant, Yakul, uh, the son of Shalamiah, and Pashur, the son of Malkiah, heard the words that Jeremiah was saying to all the people. Thus says he who is, he who stays in the city shall die by the sword, by famine and by pestilence. We've heard that in Ezekiel as well. Some of them will die by military action. Some will die because they will starve to death since the supplies are gone. And some will die by disease that always comes with famine and war. So he's telling them this is the reality. But he who goes out to the Chaldeans shall live. He shall have his life as a prize of war and live. So the offer repeatedly from God through Jeremiah is give up. Hand yourself and the city over to the Babylonians so that you can move on with your time out. Verse 3, thus says he who is, this city shall surely be given into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon and be taken. Then the officials said to the king, let this man be put to death. He's weakening the hands of the soldiers who are left in the city and the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man is not seeking the welfare of this people, but their harm. So a bunch of these guys get together and go to King Zedekiah and complain that Jeremiah, even while he's confined, is still telling people that visit him and people that are interacting with him, like soldiers, you know, and those that are coming with his daily food and water, uh, things of that nature, he's still telling them the same things. You guys need to repent. You need to give up. You need to hand yourself over to God's agent, the Babylonian army. And so these guys are mad, and they're saying, that's treasonous. It's hurting the war effort. It's making people want to give up, and we don't want them to give up. And so they want some, they want severe repercussions against Jeremiah as a traitor. Verse 5, King Zedekiah said, Behold, he is in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. So King Zedekiah feels and expresses it that these guys have got more political power than he does. He can't stop them. He, he doesn't want to be caught up in their wrath of um, claiming that people are traitors by not letting them do to, easy, uh, to uh, Jeremiah what they th- think ought to be done. So he hands them over. He's like Pilate handing over Jesus, even though he knew that Jesus hadn't done anything. So in this case, uh, Zedekiah knows that Jeremiah has been spot on in all his prophecies, but he's not going to do anything to protect him. Verse 6, So they took Jeremiah and cast him into the cistern of Malkiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the guard, letting Jeremiah down by ropes. And there was no water in the cistern, but only mud, and Jeremiah sank in the mud. So again, picture someone my age, I'm 61, that is going to be grabbed and then not tossed, but let down by ropes into the bottom of a great big water tank. 
the bottom of the water tank is uh, dirt. Uh, so it's mud from what little bit of moisture has been left. Uh, most of the water has already been used out of it. And down in the bottom, that mud is deep. And so Jeremiah's new prison cell is a muddy bottom of a cistern. And he sinks down into the mud. And we don't know how long he is there. All we know is that Someone, a non-Israeli, finds out that he's being mistreated this way, and he can't stand it. Verse number seven. When Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, a eunuch who was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern, the king was sitting in the Benjamin gate, Ebed Melech went from the king's house and said to the king, now let's talk about this guy. His, his name is significant. Ibid means servant. Melik means king. We know that he is a eunuch. Now, that's not just simply about castration. Uh, it was also something done in many of the countries of that time period to demonstrate complete commitment to a government position, a government office. I'm not going to be married. I'm married to the job. I'm not dating. I'm not interested in anything about this life. I am fully focused on my job. So this guy is a full-time government man. He's a servant of the king. And he's Ethiopian. Now, the Ethiopians were allied with the Egyptians. And in the recent history that we've been looking about, there's been this back and forth uh, tug of war over Judea between the Babylonians to the north and the Assyrian-Egyptian alliance, Egypt being the stronger of those two uh, allies, uh, so Egypt to the south. And so it may be that this guy was the long-term representative of Egyptian interests in Judea, and he's kind of been stranded here uh, when the Babylonians... Uh, set up their besiegement. But he is a man who has great respect for Jeremiah. And the moment he finds out that Jeremiah is suffering uh, down in the bottom of this well, he goes to King Zedekiah to complain. Verse number nine, my lord, the king, these men have done evil in all they did to Jeremiah the prophet by casting him into that cistern. He'll die there of hunger, for there is no bread left in the city. And then the king commanded Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, Take three men with you from here and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. So he's apparently not been in there more than a, a couple of days uh, because uh, these guys cut off his daily ration of bread when they did this. They threw him down in there to basically let him starve to death or more likely to die of dehydration exposure. Because you know, the moment he sunk down into that mud, that starts leaching out all of his body temperature. And so uh, exposure is a real big threat here. So the king gives permission and even direction to Ebed Melech to go and get him out of there. Verse 11, So ebed Melech took the men with him and went to the house of the king to a wardrobe in the storehouse, and they took their uh, from their old rags and worn-out clothes. Now, what's that about? Well, they know what happens when a person gets stuck in mud because it's a, an occurrence that sooner or later, everybody's going to run across. And what happens is your body parts that get down into the mud are caught in a bit of a, a suction. And so when you're trying to get out of the mud, the mud's still pulling at you. Um, I remember losing my shoes and boots many times uh, to that exact action in mud where I couldn't get the leverage to get out. So they know they're going to have to put some very serious force on the body of this 60-some-year-old man to get him broken free from the suction of the mud. 
So they went and got a bunch of rags so that he can put these rags under his armpits uh, and across his body so that he won't get rope burns and uh, any other damage to his body uh, from the force they're going to put on him. So they let that down to Jeremiah in the cistern by ropes. And then Ibn-Melech the Ethiopian said to Jeremiah, put the rags and cloths between your armpits and the ropes. And so Jeremiah did so. And then they drew Jeremiah up by the ropes, and you can kind of hear the <laughs> finally breaking him loose from the mud. And they lift him up out of the cistern. And then Jeremiah remained in the court of the guard. So he's back the same place he has been, but at least he's not dying in the bottom of the cistern. Now, I have zero doubt that uh, they got him all cleaned up from all that nasty mud and warmed him up and uh, fed him uh, to make sure that he uh, didn't suffer any long-term effects from this mistreatment. Verse number 14. King Zedekiah sent for Jeremiah the prophet and received him at the third entrance of the temple of he who is. Don't know exactly where this is at, but it appears to be another little covert meeting. The king said to Jeremiah, I will ask you a question. Hide nothing from me. Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, If I tell you, will you not surely put me to death? If I give you counsel, you'll not listen to me. So Jeremiah is frustrated. You know, Zedekiah will never listen to him. And he's already given permission to people to basically starve him to death. So, you know, th this is a lose-lose situation here. Zedekiah swore secretly to Jeremiah, as he who is lives, who made our souls, I will not put you to death or deliver you into the hand of these men who seek your life. So I, I make an oath to you in the name of he who is, I will protect you. I will not let you be killed. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, thus says he who is the God of hosts, the God of Israel, if you will surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, your life shall be spared, this city shall not be burned with fire, and you and your house shall live. So the offer had still kind of been on the table that if they would just repent and give in to God's demands, that God would not allow things to progress to their ultimate end. Now, of course, God already knows he's not going to do this. They're going to reject this offer. And so the fate of Jerusalem is already sealed because God is outside of time. He already knows how all these things are going to play out. Verse 18, but if you do not surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then this city shall be given into the hand of the Chaldeans. They shall burn it with fire and you shall not escape from their hand. So you won't get away. He's already told him, you're going to be arrested. You're going to be carted off to uh, Babylon. You'll never see Babylon, but you're going to be carted off there. Uh, King Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, I'm afraid of the Judeans who have deserted to the Chaldeans, lest I be handed over to them and they deal cruelly with me. So now he's being honest. This is the real Zedekiah here. He's like, the guys that have already surrendered, they're angry. They're going to be angry. They're going to be lethally angry with me for, for all the things that I've done in, in my kingship. I'm afraid to give up because I might be handed over to whatever they want done to me. Verse 20, Jeremiah said, you shall not be given to them. Obey the voice of he who is in what I say to you, and it will be well with you and your life shall be spared. But if you refuse to surrender, this is the vision which he who is has shown to me. Behold, all the women left in the house of the king of Judah were being led to the, out to the officials of the king of Babylon and were saying, Your trusted friends have deceived you and prevailed against you. Now that your feet are sunk in the mud, they turn away from you. Isn't it interesting that Jeremiah's prophecy includes a little bit of his own recent personal experience. Verse 23, continue on that same idea. All your wives and your sons should be led out to the Chaldeans, 
You yourself shall not escape from their hand, but shall be seized by the king of Babylon, and this city shall be burned. So it is inevitable. One way or another, Zedekiah is going to the Babylonians. The question is, are you going to go voluntarily, or are you going to be forced into it? If you're forced into it, bad things are going to go with that. Then Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, Let no one know of these words, and you shall not die. If the officials hear that I've spoken with you and come to you and say to you, Tell us what you said to the king and what the king said to you. Hide nothing from us and will not put you to death. Then you shall say to them, I made a humble plea to the king that he would not send me back to the house of Jonathan to die there. So Zedekiah, who's afraid of some of the powerful people in his kingdom, he says, look, Jeremiah, I'm going to send you back to the official prison. Don't tell anybody we had a conversation. And if somebody does find out and they ask you what that conversation was, you just tell them you were begging me not to be be sent back to that makeshift prison. Verse 27, all the officials came to Jeremiah and they asked him and he answered them as the king had instructed him. So he went along with the cover story. So they stopped speaking with him for the conversation had not been overheard. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the guard until the day that Jerusalem was taken. So all of this 